Church, we've done this in the past, and I'd love to be able to just experiment with it, read, read, kind of try it, and see if it maybe might stick with us as a community. Um, would you stand with me as we read this morning's uh, scripture passage that we are going to be um, looking through this morning? Revelation chapter 2, looking through uh, verses 1 through 7, it says this. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and had found them to be Uh, found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for the sake of my name and that you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from from what you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this is to your credit. You hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. Holy Spirit, may we be Um, aware and sensitive to your voice this morning. May we know what it is to be invited by you uh, to return back to a vigorous love for Jesus and for the community that you have called us to. May you speak to us this morning. And and would you encourage uh, your, your people this morning? For anyone that that is here this morning, or for anyone that might even be watching online or listening in a future date, um, that just kind of feels like they're in a place where where they're drowning or overwhelmed or have been longing uh, for you to to just show up, Lord, I pray that you might speak a word of affirmation to them today. They would know your sweetness. They would know your comfort today. And Lord, for any of us that might be in the space that in a place where we, we know that there just needs to be an awakening to happen deep within our bones. Lord, would you do that today as well? And so we say that in Jesus' name. Amen. Feel free to have a seat, church. I want to start with two absolutely thrilling words. This is where we're going to start this morning with these, with these two words. Uh, they are context and structure absolutely thrilling words, I, I, but I, I will have to dis, disappoint you that, that these two words that we're going to be covering this morning are only going to be the first half of, of our time together, and then we're going to move to a, maybe a little bit less enticing of an, and engaging of a word, where we're going to move in part two of the sermon to a word uh, reflecting on the word love. So let's first start with those really two enticing words. Let's talk about, let's talk about context, and let's talk about structure as we step here into this word, this message from Jesus to one of the seven churches as he talks to the church of Ephesus. Uh, last week, we, we talked a bit about what is the context of ha- is happening here in, in the book of Revelation, right? Because what we don't want to do and what we don't want to develop a habit of is take, simply taking a passage out of Scripture and just saying this is what it means without understanding the overall context. If you want more, um, you could go to about an hour-long message last week where we talked about the context and the structure of Revelation. But I want to just give you a little bit of a flyover this morning. Uh, we talked about that when John writes this book called the book of Revelation, he introduces it by talking, by saying um, three different 
genres. He, he mentions three different genres. He wouldn't have written it that way. Hey, I'm going to say three different genres. Um, but when he starts writing to the church, he mentions that, hey, this is a revelation. This is an apocalyptic message about Jesus. And we mentioned that that word, apocalyptic, means unveiling. Uh, it means revelation. And so the context that we're looking at when we look at the book of Revelation is that this is an unveiling of what Jesus is up to in the world around us. And then we also mentioned that he then later, later on, and just two verses later, two verses later says, um, mentions that this is a word of prophecy. And blessed, blessed is everyone that keeps the words of this prophecy. And so the book of Revelation is an apocalyptic letter, but it is also a prophetic letter. And prophecy, when it comes to the biblical understanding, isn't so much about predicting. It isn't so much about foretelling what's going to take place in the future, but it's about this, this challenge and or this comfort for the people of God to live out today. That's, that's what the Bible, for the most part, is communicating when it, when it covers that word prophecy. And then also that this is an epistle. Um, if you read in maybe in specifically like from the New Living Translation, you'll see that John says uh, a letter to the seven churches that are in Asia. So John says this is an apocalypse, this is an apocalyptic writing, this is a prophecy, this is a prophetic writing, and this is a letter, this is an epistle. And the way to summarize that is that, that this is a word from Jesus to his church, and Jesus is speaking through the heart and the imagination of John. And John is, John is a pastor, John is a theologian, and John is a poet. And it's those kind of three understandings of who John is that gives you a better understanding of what's taking place throughout the book of Revelation. So the book of Revelation, written through the heart and the imagination of John, is, is going, to be, it's going to be pastoral, right? It's going to be deep, and it's going to be caring for the churches. It's, it's going to be theological. John's mind is just so filled with Scripture, and everything that he's writing is just like he's saying, it's like this, it's like this. And when he's saying what he's seeing from Jesus, he's pulling from understandings from the Old Testament. Like, and he's using that imagery there. And John's a poet. John is, is like, it's his, his, his mind and his imagination, it's, it's colorful and it's vibrant. And when you read through the book of Revelation, you'll see that it touches all of the senses. You'll see that he'll talk about what he's seeing. You'll talk about that he'll describe incense, like there's smells to it. You'll talk about the things that, that he's seeing being touched. You'll th talk about the things that he's hearing right? So the, the, the book of Revelation is just, is, is meant to engage all of the senses. It's a book that's to be experienced. And it's, it's believed that when the, this book was read to the church, is that it was maybe even more like performed, that it was, it was, it was people that were memorizing it and, and, would, and would communicate it with a sense of passion and flair to how they read this uh, letter to one another. A little bit more about structure, I mean context, excuse me. Uh, I want, we're going to talk about geography. We're covering, man, we're covering history, we're covering geography. Maybe we'll get into like a math test after this. Um, so John was an, on an island called Patmos, and when he writes to the seven churches, you'll see that he first starts with Ephesus. And then the next church that he writes to is Smyrna, then Pergamos. And so he just moves in a counterclockwise way. So that's, that's the order that he writes to the churches in Revelations chapter 2 and 3. That's the structure. That's why we know. Um, so it's not like level of importance or who does Jesus love more or anything like that. It's just that it, this is the flow of, of how the person that was carrying the letter would have visited the churches. So from, from where John was at in exile on a land called Patmos, he would have, the, the messenger would have first went to Ephesus and then would have went to Smyrna and then just made that round trip. They were on a road trip. And um, one of the things that, that I think is worth pointing out when we look at this is 
and to some level, it's kind of like you're reading someone else's mail. Um, because in, in this book, you're getting very specific words from Jesus to specific churches. And when we start off here, John starts by saying, hey, this letter, it's from Jesus, right? And he's quoting Jesus and saying, this is from Jesus to Ephesus. And he's, as he's writing to Ephesus, it's a very specific letter. And what might have felt awkward from our understanding is that when he goes to Smyrna, whoever's going to be reading this letter to Smyrna would have still read that letter to Ephesus. That was to Ephesus. So they would have been standing in front of Smyrna and they would have heard the words of Jesus that are being spoken to Ephesus. And here's what I've, I've absolutely just loved that the way that, that theologians and biblical commentators have, have reflected on this. No, no church alone gets to understand and hear from the fullness of Jesus apart from the rest of the church. And it's this understanding that, that we, as followers of Christ, it's together that we hear the voice of Jesus. That, that it's, it's together that we learn about his pastoral, loving heart and even words of critique. And so it isn't about the churches being in competition with one another. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have been received in a way where Ephesus is like, that was pretty rough, but at least we're not Smyrna. Right? That would not have been how this was received. It would have been this place of going, oh my goodness. Look at the goodness of Jesus being expressed to us and we get to learn about the faithfulness of Jesus as we hear about what he says to Smyrna and what he says to Philadelphia and what he says to Laodicea. We get to experience the fullness of who Jesus is. Let's, let's move to this next really enticing word called structure. Because here's then what you'll notice when, you, when each letter is written, being written to the churches. So Revelations chapter 2 through chapter 3, there are seven different letters within those two chapters, right? One letter to each of the seven churches. And what's absolutely just beautiful about this is that when Jesus starts off and he says to Ephesus, he mentions that to Ephesus, from him who holds the seven stars and who's by the seven lampstands. Well, if you just go backwards one chapter, you'll see that there's this grand picture of who Jesus is and how Jesus introduces himself to Ephesus is, is one of the pictures that you get from Revelation chapter 1. And when he introduces himself to Smyrna, he, it's like he takes one of the descriptors of who he is in chapter 1 and he uses a portion of how he's described as he talks to Smyrna. And you go on and on and on. And again, it is this incredible picture that tells us one church community alone does not contain the fullness of who Jesus is, but we are the body of Christ. And when he speaks to the church, to the churches, what you get a picture of here is that it's together we portray the fullness of who Jesus is. Go on to the next place. And then when he, when Jesus gives um, at the end of each letter, you'll see the promises of Jesus um, on that next slide there. We'll get there. When Jesus ends each of his little letters to the churches, you actually see that he mentions a promise that's going to be at the very end of the book of Revelation. So when he ends his message to the church of Ephesus, he tells them that if they remain faithful, they'll eat from the tree of life. Well, that's a promise that you'll see at the very, very end of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 22. And on and on it goes. Then so that John is doing throughout this entire letter, he's connecting the church to the fact that God will remain faithful to his churches even to the very end. And to each church, you see a highlight of those promises. And then the structure of each of those seven letters 
is, is structured the exact same way. And uh, so you'll see the structure of the letter that, that the way that it starts off is, and you'll see this in, in this letter to, uh, to Ephesus. He first starts off by saying to the angel of church of Ephesus, right, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hands, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Each letter will start with a picture of Jesus. And then the next letter will move to a, a, a commendation. Here's what I know about you. Here's what I see you. I know the things that, are, that, are, that, that you're doing. This is what I value. This is what I affirm about you. And it's this incredible picture of Jesus coming to his church, and he's saying, I notice you. And it's not that he's just saying this so that he can come and bring the, the, the gut punch to the church, but it's something that he genuinely means. And if you, church, have ever felt like you've been laboring and you've been working and if you've been doing stuff in this world and you've gone unnoticed, what you see here is that the, the, the primary posture that Jesus takes towards his church is delight. I know you. I see what you're doing. I recognize you. And then he goes to a critique. I have this against you. And, and it's this understanding, it, it's this, this place that might make us a bit uneasy. Because now we're interacting with a Jesus who has a critique. He comes and he says, hey, this is, this is what I long to see changed in your life. It's been reflected by many of people. Listen, Jesus loves you just the way you are but he loves you too much to let you stay in that place. And, and he brings a course correction. Here's what, here's what I want to see shift and change in life, because I want life for you. And you'll see that right after that, he'll give some kind of challenge. Like, so, so repent, or remember, or return back to the things that you first used to do. Like, let's, let's go back to the way things were, or this is what the challenge that I have for you. Would you be a conqueror? Would you be, would you be faithful? Would you be a faithful witness in the world that, and in the city that you live in? And then he'll end with this promise. There is life ahead if you live this out. And as a side note, this structure for healthy relationship is absolutely worth embracing and getting into your bones. That first we would be present with people. First, the very first act that we, we would be in any kind of relationship with people is that we would be present with them. That people would see us and we would see others. And that our primary disposition towards others would be commendation. That we, that, we would, that we would actually speak words of affirmation and love and encouragement to the people around us. And it's when those two things are established, then, then critique can come. Right? Like, that, that, that there is this, this like, ah, oh, I've noticed this. Like, let's use, for those of you that have been in emotionally healthy relationship courses, I've noticed this, and I prefer that it would be different. Right? But then it's returning back to relationship. And the challenge is, is that, hey, let's, let's work on this together. <laughs> let's work on this together. And then there's promise. That it's, 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 and so what you see Jesus de demonstrating to all the churches here is healthy relationship. I'm available to you. I love you. I notice you. I see this. I see what you're doing. And I, and I, I appreciate who you are. Here's the critique that I have, but let's return back to a relationship. There's life ahead. There's life ahead. And, and when we just be a people that, that get that, in, again, into our bones, that when we have relationship with others, that it's that kind of sandwiching that would take place. Relationship. And then, yeah, critique. And then relationship. And, and Jesus just lives out for us in incredible ways and demonstrates for us in incredible ways what it is to have healthy relationship. I want to take a little bit of time, about five minutes today, 
and this may feel a bit awkward, this may feel a bit uh, strange or new for some people, or for some it may just feel um, like a just breath of fresh air. And what I want to do is I want to take this structure that Jesus has as we get into these seven, these letters to these seven churches, and I want us to just actually make it really personal. Let's also be a church that knows what it is to hear the voice of Jesus being spoken to us. And so what I want to do in this kind of structure is I will actually want you to, maybe if you have a journal and a pen, or if you have a, a no, an, an application on your phone that will allow you to take notes, and we're going to sit here for a little bit, and I'm going to ask questions that are taken from this structure that might hopefully help us hear the voice of God in our lives. And so you'll notice, it'll come up on the screen, the first question that I'm going to have is, I'm going to, I'm going to read the questions, and then I'm going to have a sit for like 45 seconds and see if, if the Spirit of God actually might be saying something to us. So here's, here's, here's what we're going to do. Again, if you have a journal, if you have a pen, if you have a really long forearm and a pen, listen, we want to hear the voice of God as a community and as individuals. And so let's take some time and let's actually see, using that structure, if God would want to say anything to us today. So, they're, you don't have to have a question. They're all kind of, as you look through the structure, by the way, you don't have to have an answer for every sub-question. It's just that you may have an answer for one of the set of questions in that section. That's kind of what I'm looking for. Let me ask it a different way to see if it kind of prompts anything else within you, okay? So, who is Christ to you right now? What aspect of Jesus might he want you to see? Let's take about 40 seconds and just sit with that. Okay, and the next question that we're going to sit here with for a moment is just pause and ask God if he might have a word of affirmation for you. Sit in that way to ask it maybe another way is maybe you can ask him, God, where am I, is there an area in my life that I'm getting it right? Or do you have any encouragement for where I've, I've been faithful to you? Would you sit for about 30 to 45 seconds with that and just ask? Do you have a word of affirmation? Maybe now we'll go to the next one and ask the Lord, Lord, is there a course correction that I need to make? Is there anything that, that your spirit would like to hide out, that would like to, to call out for me? Lord, is, do you have any course correction for my life? Would you sit and ponder that?
And then the last set of questions is asking God, do you have a word of promise? Is there any promise or motivation that you might have that could energize or empower me? Do you have a word of promise, Lord? Let's go ahead and sit with that. And then church, that's what I would what I would encourage you to do is is take that those set of answers or maybe whatever it is that you might have sensed, uh, God be speaking to you, and I would chat with a friend about it, and I would I would work through that with them because as we hear the voice of God, I really believe that the voice of God is best heard in community with a with a community of people that are dedicated. Uh, to understanding and opening up the scriptures. Um, if you'd like, I'd, I would love to be available to you personally if that's something you'd want to explore together. Um, but I think it's a good posture for us to have that the Spirit of God might be wanting to, to speak to us. And I think that these sets of questions may give us a wide range of ways that he might want to be speaking to us. Let's move to part two. Let's talk about this word love. Let's talk about this word love. Jesus comes to a church called Ephesus, or in, in Ephesus, and um, he starts off, man, this letter to them starts off on a high note. He writes to them, and he says, listen, I know, I know your hard work. I, I know that you are, are rooting out false teachers and people that claim to be apostles amongst you, and then you're not putting up with that. And, and I recognize that you're enduring hardship. Like this, this church is, is, Jesus starts off with this, this high word of con, commendation and, and, and encouragement for them. Like I see that you're serving. I see that you're making a difference in your city. I see that you're diligent in gaining sound understanding of Scripture. Right? What you recognize about the, where Ephesus is at, they were in a city that was teeming with worship of, of the Roman gods. Right? That, that were, where, where Ephesus was, then it was a hotbed for spirituality. Everyone in Ephesus was spiritual. And so what you see here for Ephesus is they were diligent in understanding who Jesus is and who were all these other gods were that were worshipped in their city. And so they were resolute and they were wise in, in their understanding of Scripture. And this church endured hardship. That you imagine that, if the, that the common way, that the status quo in the city around them was the worship of the Roman gods and emperor worship, to be this community of people that were going around and saying Jesus is Lord and Caesar is not, that that would have created a lot of tension and conflict for them in the marketplace. And so Jesus comes to them and he lets them know, I see it, church. I see how hard you're working. I see how intent you are on understanding scripture. And I see how faithful you are in the marketplaces. He says, but things begin to shift. And let me give you a little bit more context about Ephesus. When we look at them Here's what we know about Ephesus from reading through the rest of the pages of the New Testament. The pastors of the church of Ephesus were the Apostle Paul, St. Timothy, and John the Beloved. These are the people that pastored the church of Ephesus. The Apostle Paul, who wrote the, the, the chapter on love in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 
that Apostle Paul and his disciple named Timothy and John the Apostle, who was also called John the Beloved, where we know everywhere that he went, he would often start his, the messages that he would bring by saying this, children, love one another. This was the group of pastors that Ephesus had. If there was ever a community that was instructed in the way of love, it was the church of Ephesus. And we read this about them in Acts chapter 20. In Acts chapter 20, when the Apostle Paul was going to leave Ephesus and go on to other missional journeys, this is what happens. It says that when he had finished speaking, he knelt down with them and they all prayed. And there was much weeping among them. They embraced Paul and they kissed him, grieving especially because of what he had said, that they would not see him again. Then they brought him to his ship. Ephesus started off with vibrant love. Ephesus was a community that we, what we knew was just defined by love. Their pastors embodied love. This community, there was great affection affection amongst them for the Lord and for one another. But like the righteous brothers might quote, they lost that loving feeling. There's something took place where there is no more tenderness about them. I've, I've read this, this passage in, um, in Revelation in years past, and my understanding for the longest time and in going into this sermon series was that when Jesus comes to them and says, listen, you're doing all of these great things, but you've lost your first love, or you've lost the love that you had at first. I always thought that the instruction was you've lost your love for Jesus. That zeal, that passion, that fire that was within you for Jesus has faded. But as I've continued to study and read through different commentaries and have wrestled with this passage, what you find is, is that it seems much more likely is that there's intentional ambiguity that's here in the way that Jesus says this to the church of Ephesus. What he's saying here is, is you've, you've, lost, you've lost this culture of love about you. And it's meant to be like this all-encompassing kind of a statement for them. Is that, yes, they're, 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 they're vibrant in their theology and their faithfulness to Jesus, but there's not love in their hearts for Jesus. That, 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 that there's, they're enduring with one another. They're, they're together, they're working hard, and they're praying through whether or not the teachers amongst them are teaching heresy or not, or the people that are showing up that are claiming to be apostles, right? They're working together on this, and there are people that, are, that have a sense of unity in the way that they're rooting out these false teachers, but Jesus still comes to them and says, you've lost that love that used to be there. And I think, I think what, what's taking place here is that Jesus is coming to this church and he's letting them know, listen, yes, you should, you should serve and you should live missionally. But there's got to be love amongst you. You should pursue being theologically astute, but it's got to mingle with love. You should in, endure and persevere in this world, but endurance must be infused with love. I think the, the challenge that we read to for this church, what we take place, what, what we observe is, is when we look at this church is this. We 
we, we might have seen we might have seen a church like this and we might observe Ephesus and think, man, look how much this church does. Look at the difference that they're making in their city. What an incredible church this is because we can, we can track how much they're giving missionally. We can track how many service hours they have within their city. We might look at this church and we might be floored because, man, the Bible teaching at this church in Ephesus is so rich. The commentary about Ephesus might have been from people that, that showed up there is, I really get fed at Ephesus. The scriptures are exposited. There is such a great understanding of the word of God there. We might see a church like Ephesus and think, my goodness, what a faithful people. What a people that are, are living righteously in their city and county. Yet Jesus comes to them, and th this is a church that serves passionately. And uh, this is a church that knows the Bible and this is a church that lives faithfully. He still tells this church, because you don't have love, and if you don't repent of that, I'm going to remove the lampstand from your place. Like, love means that much to Jesus, that you can live missionally. You can have rich theology. And you can endure hardship. But if you're a loveless church, you're a lifeless church. <laughs> That's the word of Jesus. And now it's how much weight Jesus puts on love for a community of believers. There must be a culture. There must be an environment. There must be an ethos of love about a church community. Because you can do all of these great things and we can have great reports. But if there isn't love amongst us, Jesus says that's reason for a lampstand to be removed. And that's heavy. That is so heavy. I take this next area, these, these points from, from John Stott on his book that's on the seven letters to the churches. And so this is Jesus' instruction to them. Listen, you've lost the love at, at, that you've had at first. You've lost this culture, this environment of love about you. So here's, here's the challenge. I want you to remember. I want you to repent. And I want you to return. Would you remember? Would you remember? And I think there's two parts to that. Would you, would you remember what it was like for your heart to be first captured by the goodness of Jesus? Would you remember what it was like to first fall in love with Jesus and your heart to be set aflame by him? And would you remember what it was like to first come in to the body of Christ? Would you remember the passion that you had? I remember when I first started going to church, it was right around the time that I was also first starting to drive. And so I remember when I first like, started following Jesus and I would, I would drive around the, the, the city and I would see people with, with fish bumper stickers and, 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 and magnets on the back of their car. And you know what? You know the way that I think about it now is like, oh my gosh, look how you're driving. I can't believe you're driving like that with a Jesus sticker on the back of your car. But the way that I used to view it when I first started going to church was... There's a member of the family. I remember that my heart used, just used to leap. Because it was like, ah, oh, there's a brother that's right there. I used, to, I used to wrestle in high school, and that was right around the time that I started following Jesus. And um, the denomination that we're a part of is called Foursquare, which I also, because I grew up in, in L.A. County, so I was not very aware of, of snowboarding brands. 
but apparently there's a snowboarding brand called Foursquare. And I was at a wrestling competition, and as I was at the wrestling competition, we're waiting in line, we're waiting to see you know, when, when our next match is gonna be, and there was a guy that was to the right of me, and he had a beanie on, and it said Foursquare across the front. And my heart just leaped, and I was like, dude, you go to a Foursquare church? How cool is that? Like, what church do you go to? And there was just this look of absolute confusion on his face. He's just looking at me like, what in the world are you talking about? And I was like, the Foursquare, like, you don't, you don't go to church? And he's, and he's just like, it's a snowboarding brand. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, but I, I remember, I remember that zeal. Remember that, that love. Remember that fire. Remember just like this overwhelming sense of just like, oh, look at the church. Look how beautiful God's bride is. And listen, I know that, that it's easier maybe for us to say like, man, return back to the love that you had for Jesus. Because that one's easier, right? Because in a lot of ways, Jesus hasn't hurt us or offended us maybe the way that the church has. Maybe he has. Maybe we've been left confused and hurt by Jesus, and that's a little bit more difficult. But for some, it might be, listen, the church has, has hurt you and, and wounded you and wronged you. But remembering, part of that remembering is turning back to the goodness of who Jesus is and remembering his faithfulness and remembering his love for us in the midst of our own places of brokenness. Would you remember, when there be this firm foundation of the love that Jesus has for you? I'm gonna go a little bit quicker here, but the next thing that, that happens is that, that, that Jesus commends the church, would you repent? And repent, I'm continuing to find, is an absolutely beautiful and powerful word because, because I think that word repent can be defined by invitation. That it's an invitation from God to return back to his heart. It's not just merely a calling out, like, look at all the wrong stuff that you're doing. But it's like, no, like, come back to me. Repentance is a turning back to him. And I think that there's space for us to stop and we say, God, I, I, I haven't loved you. Or maybe it's a place of prayer where we say, God, expose to me, or expose me to whatever walls I have raised up and work within me and work with me in whatever defense mechanisms I have up for my perceived safety. Show me where I'm keeping others at an arm's distance and give me love and wisdom. Maybe it's a prayer that says, God, you who are love, I want to be like you. Because I recognize that I'm easily offended and I am not quick to love. Would you help my poor, weak heart and give me a heart of flesh? Because I might have real reason to be bitter, but I want my heart to be like yours. Would you return me to love? Remember, repent and return. Jesus tells the church, would you return to the practices that you used to have at first? Our first rhythm that we talked about as a church community when we talked about our rhythms of discipleship is that we would be a church that would know what it is to be with Jesus. May we establish habits and practices amongst us where we know what it is to just simply delight in the presence of Jesus not come to him because we have accomplished, not come to him because uh, we want him to do something. Those are all part of following him, but there's this place of just recognizing, God, let, let it be that I know what it is to come to you and just simply delight in your presence. But also return to practices of where you might establish love and vibrant community with the people around you. Return back to the practices of going out of your way to, to love the people around you. And maybe specifically for this community, a community that has gone through times of change, loss, and new over the last three years, 
a church community that has gone through its, its share of pain, maybe for quite a few of us in the room, it might mean this, that we become the welcoming community for the new people that Jesus might be bringing to us. That the practices that we would return to is this place of saying, what does it look like for God to use me to establish this culture and this ethos of love about us? That there might be names and faces that come to my mind that I miss, but what I recognize is, is that I, I believe that God wants to do something new amongst us. So the practices that I want to return to is establishing a loving community. And so I'm going to be the one that goes out of my way to welcome, embrace, and love the new people that God might be introducing me to. May he return us. May he, may he stir something within us so that we would be this vibrant community defined, known by our zeal for Jesus and our zeal for others. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he met with his friends. And the act that he did with his friends on the night that he was betrayed is that he washed their feet. And after washing his feet, he gave this, them this command. As I have loved you, love one another. And as we turn to the table this morning, thanks, Jeremiah. As we turn to the table this morning, I, I believe that this is, it allows us to have this posture where we get to come before the Lord in prayer and just say, may I know your love for me. May I know the love of Jesus, the love of the one who washed Judas's feet. And may that kind of love get into my DNA. May that kind of love and passion for people be something that defines who I am. Let me see with new clarity and insight today, Jesus, the genuine love that you had for Judas. And let that overwhelm me. And let that be something that defines me.